right, let's get started. So welcome to the Netflix party, everybody. Today we'll be watching uh, Working on Text Data. And so a couple of announcements maybe to start off with. The midterm should be graded right now. by now. This was a little bit more complicated because we are using a different platform than usually. Assuming that the final exam will also be uh, remote, we'll probably be using great scope for this and hopefully that will be a little bit more seamless. If you have questions regarding the grading, just post them on Piazza. Ideally, if you have questions, uh, post them publicly so uh, everybody can discuss if anything's unclear. Um, as you know, everything will be pass fail. So um, if it's like about uh, getting a point here and there, maybe uh, it doesn't matter so much. Another announcement is that um, probably next Wednesday, I will not be doing a live lecture because I'm holding a workshop. So then I will probably post the video, the lecture of the, sorry, the video of the lecture uh, directly online. So today, as I said, we'll be talking about uh, working with text data. And so this will start, um, so, sort of a section of the class that talks about some different kinds of data. So far, we always had tabular data with a fixed number of features and the features were either categorical or continuous. Um, for the rest of the lecture, there will be some other kinds of data where there is no predefined features really. And so this includes uh, free text, which we will cover today and um, in the next, say, I think one or two lectures. Um, and we'll also uh, cover images. Later, uh, at the very end of the semester, we'll cover time series. There's lots of different kinds of data um, that we're not gonna cover, such as audio, video, and uh, graphs. Um, those go sort of beyond the scope of this class, but I think these three that I picked, um, uh, text data, image data, and um, Time series data are all like very, very common and you're very likely to run across these. So I wanna make sure we get at least the basics down. So here's an example um, of some typical text data. This is a running example that we'll use uh, for all of today, which is uh, rev movie reviews from the IMDB uh, platform. And so you can see here, this is sort of a, a user provided review serves with uh, may contain uh, spoilers and um, HTML line breaks. A dude in a uh, dopey looking Kong suit, the same used in King Kong vs. Godzilla in 1982, provides uh, much of the laughs in this much mock monster flick. And then it keeps going on. So this is very, very different from an entry in a table, right? So if we look at um, text, usually each text that we look, it will have a different length of characters. And uh, so a user can input whatever they want. Often there's formatting. You can see here uh, in the first one, the user used like asterisks. Um, the second one, the user uh, used like uh, three dots a lot and smileys. And um, there's also HTML in them that probably the users didn't input, but somehow in the Entering of between entering the data and uh, we get us getting the data somewhere HTML was entered. Um, this is mostly English texts, and we will mo uh, focus most of today on English. Um, the techniques that we all discuss that work with other languages as well, though these are languages that mostly um, have words separated by white space, so the techniques we discuss today won't necessarily work for uh, Chinese and Japanese. Um, and, um, but they might work, uh, I think, uh, for Arabic, for example. All right, so the question now is, given, say, we have these two samples of reviews, um, how do we make them into uh, features that our machine learning algorithms can consume? So this is sort of the, the first potential approach is, how can we go from this data to a tabular uh, representation of the data? A different approach would be, how can we build machine learning algorithms that directly work on this uh, data? 
And that's certainly also a very interesting approach. And we'll talk about this more um, in the next uh, two lectures. Today, we'll try to go from this data that we have to a more tabular representation that we can apply our standard algorithms on. Um, so this is, this data is basically free text. So these are like, often um, samples are called documents in natural language processing or when, when dealing with text data in machine learning. Um, and so documents we usually refer to like some collection of sentences or a list of sentences that are ordered. Uh, there's also other kinds of text data. Um, this is from another data set we'll be looking at today which is uh, members of the European Parliament. And um, there's a lot of different kind of string data in here. So country, which um, I think uh, until now we might think of categorical. However, uh, maybe you saw this in the homework already. Um, even if something is categorical, uh, there might be some benefits of thinking of it as a string. See, if you have the manufacturer of a car or the model of a car, if it's picked from a drop-down list, then maybe there's like um, unique categorical values. But if the user enters this, even though um, you think of this as being a category conceptually, users might spell things in different ways and they might use different uh, phrases to refer to the same thing. So maybe someone might say United Kingdom here, someone else might uh, write UK, someone might uh, write uh, Great Britain, someone write uh, might write at GB, someone might write England. And while they all have like sort of uh, slightly different semantic meanings, they're probably all refer to the same entity in this context in some sense. Um, and so I had a, a example of this working at Amazon where um, the products uh, often have colors. And so the colors are user entered at, and I had to do some shielding on these colors. Uh, my favorite color was angry panda. So someone added, entered an angry panda into the color field and there's nothing that prevents them from doing so. And so it's very hard to convert this into a categorical value. And so um, actually using the tax information might be useful. Um, there's some other um, kinds of text data that we might see, such as uh, names. Um, sometimes they can contain information, sometimes they don't. Um, street addresses are also um, a common field that are neither really free text, nor are they um, a categorical variable really. And uh, similarly, there's named entities. You could say the country is also named entity to some degree where often you have multiple words that together refer to something. Um, but this named entity often is like spelled in different ways or like there's different ways uh, to refer to the same entity. And maybe you want to disambiguate those. But basically we'll mostly not deal with these and we'll mostly talk about uh, free text documents. And these could be, um, um, free text documents, I mean, they could be like things like this, like movie reviews, they could be comments, uh, online, they could be tweets, the tweets are very short, so they're a little bit atypical. They could also be books. So each, each sample could be a, a book by Shakespeare, or uh, you could have many, many different books, or you could have uh, Wikipedia entries. So basically we're using any free text. Um, commonly, also people use legal documents, uh, websites, anything you can think of really. All right, so the technique uh, we will be focusing on today is called uh, back of words. Back of words is a very classical way to create um, basically tabular representation or feature representation of um, text data that can uh, very easily be used to um, then later apply machine learning algorithms. The way this works is, out like, is laid out here. So you start with um, a string. And so this string here in this example is just a single sentence saying, this is how you get ads. And I said this string could also be like a whole book um, or a Wikipedia article or something like this. The first step is um, called tokenization, which is basically breaking up into words or logical units. Uh, here what we did 
is um, very simple. We just split it by white space and then lowercase everything. So this is technically tokenization and normalization in one step where um, for each word, also known as token, we try to extract some standardized representation. And so now we have a list of these tokens, this and is and how and you and get and ands. And um, okay, let me talk through this and I'll basically say a little bit more about the pros and cons of this. Once you have this list of tokens, you build what is known as a vocabulary over all possible uh, tokens in all the documents. So uh, in our movie review example, we'll look at all of the movie reviews we have and we look at all of the words that are used in any movie review. Very commonly, these vocabularies are in the um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions. If you built the vocabulary over all wor words used on the English Wikipedia, of course, it would be a very long list. And once you collected this vocabulary, you then create a sparse matrix representation. Um, so in this representation, what you do is you count for each word, how often does it actually appear in the document I want to encode? So for our sentence, this is how you get ands. If we want to encode this, then, well, I think I'm writing something on the board. Um, if we encode this sentence, then um, the word ands appears once, the word the word uh, is appears once, the word get appears once, the word this appears once, the word you appears once. And so I count one for each of these words. And all the words that don't appear, well, they appear zero times. So I have a very, very long vector. Say it is like 100,000 uh, entries long for all of the words that I'm considering, all the words in my vocabulary. And they have has a one in like the six places that correspond to the six words that actually appear. If a word would appear multiple times, I would have an, like a two or three or something like this there. So, um, so this is just a vector representation. Um, typically, as I said, there, uh, we use sparse matrix representations here. This um, means it's a particular storage format where we only store the non-zero entries. For most documents, most of the entries will be zero. Most sentences or most documents don't contain most of the words of the English language. And so we don't want to store these, all these zeros. And so basically, uh, we would only store the non-zero elements. And this is uh, possible with uh, a data structure in Python called the SciPy sparse matrix. And so instead of operating on NumPy arrays, we'll be operating on SciPy sparse matrices. There are several different formats for sparse matrices, but uh, we're not going to go into this in too much detail. The point is that if you would try to store all of these zeros, um, your memory would very quickly blow up, blow up and also all the computation would be much more expensive. So here's a toy example of how to do this with scikit-learn. So here I have two documents or two samples. Uh, one is, uh, do you want ants? And the second one is, because that's how you get ants. And so my data set or also known as a corpus, um, and it in the Mallory, is now just a list of strings. So it's like it learn, uh, a data set for text processing is a list of strings. The feature extraction that I just um, described, the back of what feature extraction is implemented in a class called count vectorizer. So as with all scikit learn um, things that start Instantiating it, then I call fit over here. In this case, fit just builds the vocabulary. So I want to look at the vocabulary. I can do this with get feature names. And I can see there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight features corresponding to the eight words that um, appear up here. And you can see that the apostrophe as was actually swallowed by the featureization process, but all the other words uh, appear there. Then, um, so what's different here is fit doesn't get a NumPy array, it gets this list of documents. And if I call transform, the result of transform is a SciPy sparse matrix. Because we can't easily look at those, 
I'm gonna here convert it to a NumPy array, and then this is the output. So the output here says, um, in the first document, do you want ands? There's one occurrence of ands, zero occurrences of because, one occurrence of do, zero occurrences of get, how, and that, and there's one occurrence of want and one occurrence of you. And then similarly for the second one, there's one occurrence of ands, one occurrence of because, and so on. So this is hopefully relatively straightforward. Another thing, uh, way you can think about uh, what the count vectorizer does is you can think about it doing um, basically one hot encoding for each word or for each token, and then adding together all the one hot encoded vectors. Uh, so the reason that this is called bag of words is that um, you don't encode the positionality of the words. You only count how often each word appears. And so uh, there's an inverse transform in the vectorizer. And um, basically what it does, it just gives you all the tokens that appeared in a particular document. So if I do inverse transform of the first row in my, of my sparse matrix, I will, uh, I'll get uh, ends do want you. And so basically the idea of the bag is basically you throw everything in the bag and you only count how often everything is in the bag, but you completely discard uh, the order of words. This is one of the main limitations of this approach, but this approach still works uh, quite well in practice, at least as a baseline. So let's run through a full example for doing text classification on this MDB movie uh, review data set. So you can easily find this online. Um, I don't have a link on the slides, uh, but if you Google ICL IMDB, you can find it. This was collected for machine learning purposes, basically. So they collected um, uh, a bunch of these reviews. Um, each review is in a separate text file. There's a helper function, scikit-learn so called load files, that allows you to um, load corpora where each document is a separate file. And so, um, the thing in the train folder, I call it text train well, and we have labels y train well that are that are generated from the folder structure. So basically in this train folder, there's one subfolder that corresponds to positively labeled um, samples and one uh, it's, uh, corresponds to uh, negatively labeled uh, samples. And so here, this is a sentiment classification task, basically where uh, each review is associated with a star rating from one to 10. And if something is rated, I think one, two, three, or four, it was counted as a negative review. And if something is uh, rated seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, it's uh, counted as a positive review. And uh, I think the five and the six were just thrown away by the person that curated this data set. And so this curated data set, um, now it's a list of strings. So text train value is just a list. Um, the length is 25,000. And um, because the machine learning scientists collected the data set, it's balanced uh, 12,500 positive and 12,500 negative data, uh, samples. Of course, in a real data set, it wouldn't be balanced. And it's probably not balanced if you just pick sa samples at random. But um, to be nice to all the machine learning people so you can use accuracy, the data set is balanced. We already saw some examples. Here's an example uh, that is uh, example number one. So the second example says, uh, words can't describe how bad this movie is. I can't explain it by writing only. You have to see it for yourself to get a grip at how horrible a movie really can be. And then it goes on and on. And, uh, oh yeah, uh, I think maybe it's swallowed by the, by the slide. If you look at the label, this um, review is labeled negative. Uh, as you might imagine. So now let's train a binary classifier on this, trying to classify the positive versus the negative reviews. Um, what I did is I removed all the HTML first. There's not really a need to do this, but I, I 
sort of the data looks a little bit cleaner and nicer if you do this. So I just removed the um, all the HTML line breaks. And this assumes that they didn't contain on uh, any information. Oh, there's decode here. So, okay, I don't really want to talk about string processing in Python, but in Python 3, so we are all using Python 3 now, Python 2 is, is over. Uh, in Python 3, there's basically two string types. There's string and there's bytes. And um, so bytes is basically a raw encoding uh, of the raw data and strings have an associated uh, encoding. And here, my God, hopefully I don't get it the wrong way, the right way around. Um, so this is the text train wall, I think, was bytes. And if I do decode, it comes, no, it should be the other way around, right? Okay, this is, this is slightly embarrassing. Um, No, so this this was bytes, exactly. And so to display it, I want to tell it, well, these bytes, um, so this large representation of the data actually corresponds to UTF-8 strings. And um, I'm not sure if there's any UTF-8 symbols in here, but basically this, um, maybe this apostrophe. Apostrophe is a UTF-8 symbol, you never know. Maybe there's a space in here that's a UTF-8 symbol. Um, but basically it tells us how to interpret the, the stored raw data as a string. And so the default argument here is UTF-8. And so it says, decode this, uh, assuming that the data is represented as UTF-8. And so you could also try to decode this with a different um, character set, and then you would get a different outcome. But um, basically the way the data was read, it was read so that it's stored as UTF-8. Okay. Um, there's great tutorials online about string, um, string uh, processing in, in Python. And so I don't want to spend too much time on that today. Okay, so I split the data in the training test set, and then I trained my count vectorizer on the training data set. I call actually fit transform. So fit transform finds the vocabulary and then does the vectorization. And the vectorization is stared in X train. Then I also apply transform to text val and uh, in XVAL, we uh, have to um, vectorize representation of the validation data set. And so if I, if I print X train, what, what I get is this. It's 18,750 times uh, 66,651 6, space matrix of class NumPy int. So this means uh, in the train data set, we have 18,750 samples. Again, samples are rows. Features are columns, and there are 66,651 features. This means the vocabulary size is 66,000 something. So there are 66,000 uh, tokens that were extracted from this data set. Um, as I said, most, um, most comments will not contain most words. So this is a highly sparse matrix, and so it says there's about 2.5 million non-zero entries in this big matrix. But once we have this representation, so basically everything in scikit-learn can work on the sparse data representation, um, we can now just do our standard machine learning. I mean, maybe before we do this, we can look uh, briefly at the uh, feature names. So here, the first 10 feature names, the feature names by default, they're ordered by, um, lexically ordered. So if you look at the first 10, they're just zero, 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 zero. Okay, I'm not gonna read all of these. Most of these are probably not um, very semantically meaningful. The last one is actually zero, zero, seven, which in this data set actually has a spe uh, semantic, specific semantic meaning because it's a movie data set. Uh, if you look somewhere just in the center, uh, you can see there's just like, um, 
like some subset of English words um, potentially having like names and having misspellings and having plurals and like escalator is probably escalator. And um, so this is just sort of the words people used, including all the misspellings and so on. And this data set, given that it's about movie reviews, it, uh, has a lot of like movie titles, character names, actor names, director names, and so on. To get more of like an overall uh, view of the kind of word that, have, that appear here, I'm looking at every uh, 2000s word. And yeah, you just get sort of an, a random sampling of the things that you could see. So it goes from makes to Mickey to Yangs to way with uh, four A's. And each of these corresponds to a different feature in our data set now. So now that we did this vectorization, we can just train our classifier as we would usually do. I'm being a little bit lazy here and use logistic regression CV, which does internal cross validation to find the uh, C parameter. It finds uh, C equal to 0 0.046 to be optimum. On, and then I can call a score on the validation set and I see it's 88.2% accurate. Given the data set is balanced, we know this is sort of a non-trivial achievement in some, uh, with some respect, uh, we're uh, nearly 90% accurate at, on a 50-50 data set. So that's pretty good already. And this is using a very, very simple technique. It's actually, you need to put in quite a lot of work to beat this technique on this data set. Oh yeah, so we, we can now look at um, the coefficients of this um, linear model. So given that there are 66,000 something features, we obviously cannot look at the 66,000 um, coefficients. So I only look at um, maybe like the 15 um, highest and 15 lowest coefficients um, together with the feature names here. And so the words that are more, most indicative of a negative review are worst, waste, awful, boring, poorly, horrible, uh, worst, poor, stupid, disappointing, and so on. And um, the words indicative of a positive review are like excellent, perfect, wonderful, amazing, superb, today, favorite, love, brilliant, enjoyable, and so on. Um, and these make generally sense. Maybe the today is a little bit uh, confusing, but I think in context it would make sense. But um, overall, these seem pretty, pretty reasonable. And so we learned that uh, which words are indicative of positive reviews and which words are indicative of negative reviews. Again, uh, this representation completely discards the order of words. However, there's like, uh, there's many, many options in uh, what we could do here. And um, we'll talk briefly about some of the options. So one is, how do you tokenize? Um, so how do you split up things into words? In scikit-learn, we're just splitting by white space. And I'm gonna talk about the, how do you normalize? So once you split up, um, do you standardize the words in some way? Like uh, dealing with plurals and so on. And what do you actually include in the vocabulary? So scikit-learn is not really a fully fleshed NLP library, but scikit-learn has a bunch of things that are quite useful. Uh, and it's a pretty good baseline. Um, so the splitting for tokenization is done with uh, this regular expression. If you're not super familiar with regular expressions, but we see what it says. It says um, uh, you want a word boundary, then you want an alphanumeric uh, character, then you want at least one more alphanumeric character, then you want a word boundary. And so this includes numbers as long as there's more than two, more than one digit. It discards every single letter words in single digits. And if you have a dash or an apostrophe, it breaks up words. And there's like way, way, way more ways to uh, do tokenization than just doing a rec regular expression. But this is like, this works, works reasonably well in practice. You can customize it if you want. You can change the token pattern. So here I'm using a different regular expression that basically says, word boundary, then an alphanumeric, at least one alphanumeric character, and then um, word boundary. So here it's enough if there's only one alphanumeric character 
And so I also get the get an S as a token if I do this on my text on my um, toy example because the apostrophe breaks up the that's and the S is taken as a single token. You can also say, well, I also allow apostrophes. So here, say I want a alphanumeric character, and then I want um, an alphanumeric character or an apostrophe in at least one of them. So this way, I would get that as a single token. These these things usually don't make that much um, difference in practice, but you can you can tweak them and play around with them. The, um, a thing that might be more important is normalization. So normalization, well, maybe going back to tokenization. So this is the reason why I said this won't work on Chinese because tokenization in Chinese is much harder. As I said, I have no idea about this. And uh, in languages where you can't split by white space, basically, um, or we, where you can't split easily with a regular expression, this will fail. And you need to have a much more advanced technique to split things up into words. Um, so normalization is given the to having split up, split up things into tokens, can we find a normalized version of the token? So in scikit-learn, this is just um, lower casing everything. So scikit-learn doesn't distinguish between something with that starts with a capital letter or something the same thing starts with a lowercase letter, or if it has a capital letter anywhere it, in the word which might just be a misspelling or might be some fancy spelling, scikit-learn will not distinguish between those. Um, there, but there's many more uh, variants of normalization. Uh, two that are sort of the most, the biggest families are stemming and lemmatization. Stemming is basically means there's many ways to stem. It's a heuristic to get back to the word stem. So this usually tries to get rid of plurals or ing at the end of word of the word or ed at the end of word. So it tries to um, get rid of um, any declinations or something like this. In English, this can be helpful. In languages like German, this is essential. Like if you look at German or French, then um, there are so many different forms of a, a word that if you had a different feature for each different form of the word, it would be really, wouldn't work very well. In English, because the words are usually not modified that much in English, it's not as bad, but it can still help. Lemmatization is um, a more advanced technique where you basically smartly reduce the word to the stem. Um, neither of these is actually implemented in scikit-learn. Um, I think I'll give some um, recommendations later. So two libraries in Python that you can use for this are uh, Spacey and NLTK. But, yeah, I'll mention it again later. Here is an example um, of a document uh, saying, our meeting today was worse than yesterday. I'm scared of meeting the clients tomorrow. So this is a example I picked because you have meeting in here twice, but um, it's a noun in the first sentence and it's uh, it's a verb in the second sentence. So these so um, the first one is a form of the, to meet, and the second one is a noun meeting. And so probably they shouldn't be the same thing. Um, or the first one should correspond to the verb to meet, and the second one should correspond to a noun meeting. And so if you do stemming, stemming usually uses something like a regular expression or like a lookup table. And the lookup table will, um, well, it keeps our, it makes meeting in, into meet. And um, things like was and worse, it just drops the S and the E respectively. So this is like pr pretty silly uh, way to process it, but um, scared becomes scare, meeting becomes meet again, um, and so on. Clients become client. Um, if you do lemmatization, so I'm not going to go into how this works, but this takes uses uh, part of speech tagging and like fancy NLP stuff. Um, and basically, here you can see that um, was so our meeting, where meeting is a noun, stays a noun or stays meeting. Um, was becomes be, worse becomes bad. Um, 
I am becomes I be, uh, scared becomes scar, and here meeting as the verb becomes meet. So it distinguishes meeting, this meeting from this meeting. This one stays the way it is. This one was normalized to meet. Um, so that's kind of cool. This is, I'm using spacey for both of these, I think. Um, and I think this example code is in, in, the, in, in my book. I said, yeah. And it's like a learn by default, just lowercase and stuff, but you can use NLTK or spacey. This is not the first thing I would tweak. And maybe these days I wouldn't do this at all and use something that we're gonna call BERT and we're gonna discuss in, uh, in like two lectures. But um, basically if you want a model that's relatively simple and inter interpretable um, and you have your back of words model and it works and you wanna tweak it a little bit, maybe using um, stemming lemmatization could give you like a little extra edge, but it's usually not gonna make a huge difference. All right, so let's talk about restricting the vocabulary. There's um, a couple of ways to restrict the vocabulary. The first I wanna talk about is stop words. So stop words means words that are discarded because they are not semantically meaningful usually. And um, so usually this, uh, you use uh, lists that were curated and uh, for a particular language. So here, saying stop words equal to English in scikit-learn, this is the only stop words that are supported um, or have built in, means remove words that are very, very common in English and don't usually have um, like a lot of semantic meaning or add semantic meaning to a document. If I set uh, the stop words to English in my Mallory example, the only words that, that um, remain are ants and want. Here is at the bottom, you can see the list of the English stop words in scikit-learn. And um, like, there, there has been a lot of arguments. The thing is you can't really have uh, one stop word list to like, um, for all purposes, it depends a little bit on your purpose. Um, so think that usually in stop word lists would be like, not this, the, a, i, u, uh, b, uh, because, get, other pronouns, things like this. Um, if you look at this, there are some things that maybe are a little bit uh, unexpected, like, I don't know, former, or um, I think system is in here. Cry is in here. I'm not sure why cry would be a stop word. Um, and so some of them are a little bit, uh, a little bit strange, but uh, we, we thought about fixing, like fixing this, but then we realized basically there's no one standard stop word list and it's better to do, to use stop words on, um, based on what your application is. For supervised learning, actually the stop, stop words may be not that important. For unsupervised learning, I have found them to be much more important because in unsupervised learning, basically stop words make for most of the words, like if you have a and the and he and all of these and and um, most of the English language is sort of this and they appear much more often so they dominate any unsupervised learning. Uh, for supervised learning, I haven't found it to be that critical. Also, this list for scikit-learn is like 200 long or something, or, two, or maybe 300. So if you remove all the stop words, in this example, in our MDB example, you go from um, 66,600 something to 66,400 something. Um, so it doesn't really reduce the feature space a lot. Other ways to restrict vocabulary. Um, okay, so Maybe I should say, why would you want to restrict the vocabulary? So there's two reasons, um, or maybe three reasons. So if you have a small vocabulary, everything becomes faster. You have less storage space and you can, it could be um, more interpretable. And um, so these are basically the same reasons why you do feature selection. And um, so maybe also uh, if you throw away 
features that are distracting or that lead to overfitting, you might also get uh, better accuracy. Um, another way to do um, to restrict the vocabulary is to remove words that appear in less than k documents. And there's an argument called MinDx stands for minimum document frequency. So how many documents or how many samples does a word need to appear in to be in vocabulary? And so by default, this is one. So everything that appears will be taken to the vocabulary. I think one makes no sense and two is much better. Uh, two means that a word only uh, needs to appear in at least two documents to be part of the vocabulary. If something appears only once, it's very likely that it's a misspelling or um, like a very weird name or weird spelling of something. If something appears only once, it's very hard to learn anything uh, meaningful from it, I would say. If we do this for the Mallory text, because there's only two documents, um, it throws away a lot of things. Um, you can also go the other way around and restrict the vocabulary size um, to the K most common or most frequent words. Uh, if you do set max features, um, it will keep only this amount of features based on the document frequency. All right, so here's an example of um, what this looks like. So X train, this was uh, using how does max features break ties is a question. Uh, it doesn't, I think. I think it's unlikely that there's ties, but um, probably just lexical sorting. Okay, so X train was our original uh, no parameters to count vectorizer, and uh, we got 66,600 features. If you set min df to two, we get about uh, 40,000 features. So this means we reduced um, the feature number of features by about a third, um, meaning a third of the tokens we had only appeared in a single, doc single document. Something like this zero, 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 like eight zeros in a row probably didn't appear that often, you know? Um, and so maybe now we have more semantically meaningful features. If we restrict it to the minimum document frequency being four, we, um, restricted even further to only about 27,000 features. So now we have less than half of the features we originally had. Um, if I use mindf equal to four and I do my logistic regression CV, actually the accuracy is as good as it was before, even though we have a much smaller feature space. Um, okay, maybe, so just as a small, um, actually, give me one second, I want to see, oh, okay. Um, another transformation you can do um, that keeps the same vocabulary but uh, reweights the words is uh, called TFIDF rescaling. In a sense, this is similar to um, something like uh, uh, soft stop words. The idea of TFIDF, TFIDF stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. This comes from the um, information retrieval literature. And the idea is that um, if something appears in many, many documents, it's not that, that uh, useful. For example, in this corpus, probably most reviews will contain the word movie or film, but the word movie or film is completely uninformative. So we don't want to really put a lot of um, emphasis on the word movie and film. So the idea is that we use the term frequency, which means how often does a term appear in a uh, particular document, divided by the document by the uh, document frequency, which means how many documents in how many documents does the term appear. So if something appears in all the documents, we basically assume it's not informative. This is something that is um, was used basically as a distance measure between documents. 
um, or sorry, to, to create a distance measure between documents, this is like slightly um, less important for supervised learning again, but um, it's very useful for nearest neighbors. So I think maybe this come, came originally from like web search or document search. So if, uh, if you think about it, if the occurrence of a very common word like and is the same between two documents, it doesn't say a lot about the documents. But if both documents have, I don't know, a very specific word like uh, GPU, then maybe that means that these documents are very related. If you have two documents that um, use that both use the word the, probably doesn't say a lot about these documents. If you have two documents that say the word logistic regression, they're probably very similar. And so this tries to reweight um, um, basically each uh, word by how much, uh, how often it, uh, how often it appears, and how many documents it appears. Actually, um, so it's not directly uh, TF divided by IDF, it's IDF is defined as this logarithm and there's a couple of plus ones to smooth it. This is the way it's implemented in scikit-learn. There's like, one of the plus ones is non-standard and I forget which it is. Um, I think maybe it's the one in the end actually that's non-standard. You can look at the scikit-learn documentation for, for the different options on this. But it's, this is another thing that might give you like a slight edge and it might be more flexible than uh, just using stop words because it is sensitive to the corpus that you're using right now. Oh, and one thing that you should be aware of, if you use this in scikit-learn, then um, this also does L2 normalization by default. L2 normalization, what I mean by this is what the normalizer does. So by default, TFIDF will also divide everything by the row norm. So each sample will be divided by the row norm. This is a very common normalization in NLP, and it basically means that you're trying to discount how long a document is. So the overall count doesn't matter as much as the relative counts. These are, um, so the TF-IDF rescaling is implemented. You can use either TF-IDF vectorizer or TF-IDF transformer. TF-IDF vectorizer takes in lists and does the, basically what count vectorizer does plus the TF-IDF rescaling. TF-IDF transformer takes in a sparse matrix and produce, and then just does the rescaling. So, um, Unless you want to do something specific, usually I just use TFIDF vectorizer, which takes the list of strings and produces the uh, rescaled, um, the rescaled uh, features or rescaled counts. And here you can see these are, this is basically a TFIDF vectorizer is equivalent to a pipeline of count vectorizer and TFIDF transform. And it's just a convenience thing. All right. So these were like all the, the, the basic ideas. Um, before we go back to retuning things on the, on the IMDB data set, I wanna talk about one more extension, which is going beyond single words. So, and I said, one of the main downsides of like words is that they look only at single words uh, and, only, and completely discard the order of words. But uh, there's a very big difference between didn't love and love. They mean exactly the opposite, but if you look at the word counts, they're very, sim very similar. You could also say like, love comma didn't hate and hate comma didn't love have exactly the same word counts, but mean exactly the opposite. So the context is actually quite important in language. It's a little bit, it's, it's quite interesting that even if you completely ignore the context, um, back of words still works, but in some cases or many cases, um, going beyond using these single words without context uh, can improve things. And so the uh, simplest and most common extension is what is called n-grams. n-grams means um, looking at what is uh, means looking at tuples of neighboring words. 
So what we looked at so far is often known as unigrams, meaning you look at one token at a time. In n-grams, um, you look at n tokens at a time. Um, the simplest case would be bigrams. In bigrams, you look at two neighboring tokens. So if you do count vectorizer on this is how you get ants with bigrams, you will get this is, is how, how you, you get, get ants. And um, usually you, you would use the uh, unigrams and then put this together with the bigrams. You would not only use the bigrams, but you would always use unigrams plus bigrams, maybe plus trigrams. So you always use all the shorter ones plus the, the longer ones as well. And so this way you get some context because if you have like, so because now you can distinguish between didn't love and love. So here on a toy example, um, again, so the, um, what kind of n-grams are extracted, you can configure using the n-gram range parameter. Uh, the n-gram range is a tuple and with first the minimum number of tokens to consider and then the maximum number of tokens to consider. So the default is one comma one, which means look at unigrams. If you only want to look at bigrams, it's two comma two. If you want to look at uh, unigrams and bigrams, then you would do one comma two. So just doing two two is like very unusual. So I would usually do one comma two or one comma three. If I want to look at uh, bigrams or trigrams. Okay, my mouse is not working. And um, so typically there's many more bigrams than there's unigrams. Um, because it's not really um, quadratic. So if you think naively, like if words were random, then you would have uh, the growth in the number of bigrams would be quadratic, but language has a lot of structure, but still there's a lot, of more, lot more bigrams than there's unigrams in a given text. Um, so here are different vocabulary sizes, um, looking at unigrams, unigrams and bigrams, or looking at unigrams, bigrams, unigrams and bigrams, and then up to trigrams and uh, foregrams. So for all of these, I said min df equal to four, because earlier we saw min df equal to four work pretty reasonably for uh, unigrams. For unigrams, we got uh, with min df equal to four, so only looking at tokens that appear four times or more, um, we got 27,000 features. If I look at all the bigrams that appear four times or more, I get 128,000 features. If I include both unigrams and bigrams, obviously I get the sum of the two, uh, which means 155,000 features. If I look up at trigrams and foregrams, I get uh, 254,000 features and 289,000 features respectively. Uh, here, actually, the number of features doesn't seem to increase that much going from trigrams to bigrams. That is because most of the, uh, sorry, from trigrams to foregrams, because um, most of the foregrams are pretty rare. If I, um, if I leave out this uh, min df, and um, I look at uh, min df equal to one. Actually, if I look to, from one to four grams, I get 7.8 million features. So I get 20, 20 times more features if I leave out the min df equal to four. So you can see this actually really, really uh, reduces the number of features I'm considering if I'm looking at higher order n grams. Also, the impact of stop words is increased um, because most n-grams will contain stop words. So the way scikit-learn does um, remove stop words, it, it removes the stop words first and then it computes the n-grams. And um, very common bigrams would be for each noun, the, and then the noun. This is a, if you see the noun, 
usually it has the in front of it or a. That's how English works. And um, so you have these very common bigrams that don't really mean a lot. So if you remove the subwords, you actually get a much, much less um, bigrams and trigrams. So here, again, uh, using unigrams and bigrams with men f equal to uh, four, you get 155,000 um, features. If you set, if you use stop words, you're nearly halving this to only uh, 81,000 features. So re remember, removing just stop words removes like 200 features. But if I remove the bigram, if you remove stop words and then compute the bigrams, this actually makes a very big difference. At least the way it is uh, done in in scikit-learn. Oh yeah, and I thought it would be interesting to see. Um, so if you look at um, the four grams that appear at least four times after you remove the uh, English stop words, there's only 369 left. And so I thought it would be fun to look at them. And so I looked at them and um, these are the results. Uh, worst movie I've seen, 40 year old virgin, which apparently is a movie. Um, Low budget horror movie, bad, 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 bad. Um, anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting the, the phrases that commonly appear. Um, here is now a model um, using uh, n grams. So I use unigrams, y grams, and trigrams. Um, first with stop words and then without stop words. Um, and you can see that, you can see things like the worst is, has very, uh, is very important, not very, um, or at all. Um, at the end appears, uh, one thing that I think that was interesting is there's, I think there's not worth here and well worth here. So worth by itself is unclear what is the sentiment behind it, but not worth is clearly negative and well worth is clearly positive. So here the bigrams really help us. There's no trigrams in the, in the top 10 here. Um, if you exclude the stop words, a bunch of these go away because a bunch of these actually had stop words and I didn't really like that they went away. So I think you, we're getting actually, we have about the same performance removing the stop words, but some of the things they like uh, are, went, went away. Um, one thing that's also interesting is, if you can see he, down here, there's, a, there's 10, 10. This is actually label leakage. So some people apparently put the number of stars that they, that they gave it in the comments. So they put in 10 out of 10 points in their, in their review. And so um, this is probably not something that we want to include in our classifier because it's basically just the, the label. Um, okay, there's a question asking, uh, is there a reason why the top 10 features are having a lot of unigrams compared to bio trigrams? Um, I mean, I think that the unigrams are just the most informative, right? The, they just appear the most and they, um, that's what we have the most infor uh, information about. And so this is why you would always include the unigrams because they're usually more, the most informative and the other ones just give you like a little bit more information, but they will not like drastically alter uh, the results. Oh yeah. Um, I then like kind of played around with it um, and removed well and not from the stop words and did the same, the same thing again. And then I got results that I kind of liked better because I didn't, I thought not was very important for this. So I didn't want to remove it. Um, and then I want to kept the not worth and the well worth. Um, but like the performance here is only like marginally better than what we had before. So it's probably like the tweaking around, it's unclear how much it actually gains us, but um, like the results are definitely interesting.
All right, so we don't have that much time anymore. Um, so I might go a little bit quicker over the character engrams. Um, so they are somewhat less useful, but um, it's all good to know about. So we can up the same that apply, uh, thing that we just applied to words, we can also apply to characters. And so you know, we have a sentence like you want and ands, instead of um, splitting by white space and then looking at words, we can just look at the raw characters. And so we could use do space, like if I look at character trigrams, it would be do space, o space, y, and space, y, o, and so on. So I could just uh, build the vocabulary of all the uh, uh, three characters in a row that appear. This is um, basically throwing away a bunch of the structure of the English language, but it can be more robust towards um, uh, misspellings. And it can sometimes be helpful for capturing like particularly like emoticons or um, if someone wants to obscure words or um, also, if there's like made up words, um, it's also commonly used in language detection. Um, so it's very easy to detect what language a text is in uh, by looking at the character engrams. This might also help with things like addresses or named entities or uh, other um, sort of misspelled or differently spelled uh, categorical variables. Um, yeah, or like works with like, if you want properties of like made up words or names or something like this. Um, and you can basically do this by using analyzer equal to a char for character. Usually you don't want to use unigrams um, or because single character counts are not that informative, but um, I mean, for language detection, it might even be informative. Um, you can, with, if you use analyzer equal to car, uh, char, then it will just use all possible um, engrams. If you do char uh, wb for word boundary, that will then it will not go across word boundaries. So it will, here you can see there's something like s white space h, which includes one letter from one word, the white space between the words, and then the h from the next word. Um, which you don't get at the bottom here. So generally, I wouldn't use this for standard text analysis. You can use it. Um, so here, if I use it on the INDB data set, I get actually a very big vocabulary. And, um, but I get a result that's uh, pretty similar in the end. Uh, however, like it's less interpretable, I would say, because the most important feature are all like different substrings of words. So we have Worse, worst that probably has a white space after or before, uh, worst, worst, and so on. You can also see a couple more label leakage things here with three and four appearing, and in the on the other side like seven and eight and seven out of ten uh, appearing. So I think this is like less interpretable. I just want to show you you could do this if you really wanted to. Okay, so I'm going to skip this application. So um, this was um, basically trying to break the nationality based on name for people in the European Parliament, but um, <coughs> let's just skip this. Um, other things you should think about is like what other features can you create and what other features could be important for your application. Um, so if you look at like restaurant reviews or Amazon reviews or something, things that might be interesting might be the length of text. If you look at post online, like the number of out of vocabulary words might be interesting because um, basically if someone misspells a lot, that might be it says their, their content is like less well written or um, maybe they're name dropping a lot of people or I don't know. So if there's a lot of words that are not 
part of vocabulary that could mean something. Uh, if you do sentiment analysis or anything like this, the presence and frequency of all caps might be interesting. What kind of punctuation is used? Um, there's actually lists of sentiment words, like how many good words are used, how many bad words are used, um, how um, you can also like check out how many misspelled words are used, how many square words are used. Um, whatever makes sense for the task, really. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, large-scale text vectorization, which is um, basically some uh, a trick uh, to get around building a vocabulary and potentially work more quickly with very big vocabularies. So the workflow that we looked at so far with back of words is you um, start with your string, you tokenize it, you build a vocabulary over everything, and you do a sparse matrix encoding. Um, one downside of this is that you need to know the whole vocabulary ahead of time. And, um, Oh, sorry, there was a question. So why is using character engrams better than word engrams for the task of language detection? Um, I guess like the vocabulary would just be very, very, needs, would be, need to be very big and you would need to uh, have a lot of text for training a character, uh, a word engrams. Like, um, like if I see O-U-X, I know it's French, you know, it's, um, And like different languages have very, very um, specific like um, sequences of letters that they use. Um, oh, another question was like, how do we know uh, good and bad words? You can just download good and bad words. So you could use it as a feature. There's like lists of words that are associated with being good. There's lists of words that are associated with being bad because people have been doing sentiment analysis for a very, very long time. And so you can add as a new feature, how many sentences from the good list were picked, and how many sentences from the bad list were picked. So you can just, if you don't have that much data, you can just hard code this in as a feature. Okay, so going back to large scale. So one of the downsides of the bag of word approach that we looked at so far is that you need to have the vocabulary beforehand and you need to store the vocabulary. Um, but you can get around this by like uh, just one simple trick, which is use hashing instead of a vocabulary. So the basic idea is that you pick some hash function, uh, scikit-learn uses one called murmur hash, and um, instead of building vocabulary and looking at which place in a vocabulary is a certain uh, feature, you just hash each word. So if you give the hash, the string this, in the case of one more hash, it will give you 832,412. And you just count how often this appears and you say, well, um, the count of this is one and this corresponds to the feature number 832,412. So the hash gives you basically the, the, uh, the index of the feature you're gonna use. And so you're gonna use the same sparse matrix encoding, but you never have to build a uh, vocabulary. This basically assumes that um, you has, have a hash that has like a big enough space. So in this case here, I think it uh, creates numbers up to 1 million. And so you will get a million features, no matter what uh, data set you put, you use, you will always have a million features. And um, if you have a very small data set, most of these features will never um, appear. And um, but sort of it, it will be constant. And if you observe 
let's say um, if you observe in a streaming context, if you observe um, new words, you can um, retrain a model without rebuilding your vocabulary. So the trade-offs of this is that is, this is very fast. You can work on streaming data um, and it has a very low memory footprint because you can't, um, uh, you, you don't need to um, store the vocabulary. The, uh, the downsides of this is that it's very hard to interpret the results because if you have a coefficient vector, you can't really say what do the co like what word does this coefficient vector correspond to because we don't, we don't have the words anymore. We only have the hash or the index. So this also makes it quite hard to debug. A question that um, uh, often comes up and that was already asked in the chat is, are collisions a problem? So if you have an arbitrary hash function, two different words might hash to the same uh, number. So you can have two words that are completely unrelated and um, that give you hash to the same feature number. So basically these two features will be um, like, um, the model will not be able to distinguish between these two words. In practice, it turns out that this is not really an issue because it's very rare that um, both of the words that you mesh together are important for a particular task. And so people have done experiments and yes, if you do a very, very small space, then uh, of course, if you use like 10 features, it will be a problem. If you use like 100,000 or a million features, then it doesn't matter. And so um, if the feature space is big enough, as long as you have um, sort of enough features, it's fine and collisions don't matter for uh, model accuracy. Um, and so this is implemented in scikit-learn in the hashing vectorizer. Uh, hashing vectorizer is basically a drop-in replacement for count vectorizer um, with two differences. One difference is you don't have to call fit. It might be the only model in scikit-learn where you don't have to call fit, or maybe there's one more. Uh, maybe there's one of the kernel approximation ones, but I'm not really sure. So you don't have to call fit. And the other is, um, it actually uses L2 normalization by default. So the thing that um, TFIDF vectorizer uses by default, the dividing by the L2 norm each row, um, hash, hashing vectorizer also does that. So if you replace count vectorizer by hashing vectorizer, you will get different results because one of them does L2 normalization and the other one doesn't. Um, but other than that, um, works basically the same way. No, oh, I forgot the scores here, but um, so the score is basically the same for uh, using count vectorizer or hashing vectorizer. And um, you can see here that x train dot shape is um, like there's one million, uh, yeah, a little bit more than uh, one million features. This is just a default. And so by no matter what you text, uh, you will give it. This is just a number of features that we'll be, have by default. I think it's like some power of two is why this is the number. So uh, powers of two are sort of uh, nice for computational reasons. That's what is, or maybe it's the sum of two powers of two or something like this. Maybe, is it 10 to the 10? No, uh, two to the 10, it's not two to the 10. Um, so we talked about uh, partial fit, I think, earlier when we talked about gradient descent. So a standard application of this would be to use hashing vectorizer together with um, partial fit to learn on, ah, it's 2 to the 20. Thanks, Thomas. Thomas? Or Thomas? Um, um, sorry, what time? Yeah, so a standard application would be um, doing this together with um, partial fit. So you have, if you have a streaming data set, say like 
Twitter or like a Facebook timeline or something like this, you could keep updating an existing model. And if there's new words that appear, you don't need to throw away the old model because the hashing vectorizer basically deals with it. And this can be useful um, if you're dealing with news. Um, often new, new words appear in news, like recently, let's say coronavirus was a word that maybe in January would not have been part of your vocabulary, but now it is like part of every news story. And so um, you could adapt an existing model to um, a drifting vocabulary. So as I said, there's a couple other libraries you can look at. So there's three in particular that I want to point out. Um, I think we'll see a little bit of them uh, next time. Um, so there's NLTK, which stands for Natural Language Toolkit. It's um, uh, sort of the classic one in Python. It's very comprehensive. It's a little bit outdated. They have a very good book that I think is available for free that talk, talks through a lot of it. Um, it can be sometimes a little bit slow, but basically it definitely has all the classic methods. It might not have the newest methods. There's another one called Spacey that's a little bit newer, but now also like, I don't know, probably like five, six years old or something, or maybe even more now. Um, this is maintained actually by a, a group of people that have a company together and they just like a very high quality package. It's what I probably would recommend these days. And um, it has all the modern stuff, it's fast, it has some neural network stuff in there, uh, even um, some, like last time I checked, like sometimes the API still changes a little bit because they're developing it very actively, but probably not much worse than, than the API of scikit-learn. Um, so space is probably what I would uh, recommend if you wanna do any more um, uh, uh, in-depth NLP. So there's a couple of questions. Let me just finish up this the last slide and then I'll answer the questions. Um, and so Agentum is another uh, library in, psych in, in Python that's also working for text processing, but it's mostly focusing topic modeling. So we'll talk about this um, uh, next Monday, I think. And um, so Agentum also has some like some general NLP stuff, but not as much. So I think the two like, most commonly li used libraries are NLTK and Spacey with like more recently people uh, using Spacey more, more commonly. And both of them, NLTK and Spacey, they have like some wrappers for scikit-learn stuff, but you can also use them in other ways together with scikit-learn. All right, so two questions I have. Um, the first one is about the hashing. So here the question was, how do we get the specific number? All right, so, um, okay, can I can I give you the definition of what is the hash function? So, I mean, there's like, this is not a, uh, I'm not sure if this is a cryptographic hash function that we're using, but basically, the hash function here, um, you could also use the build in Python hash function. It's a function that takes in a string and produces an integer. And um, generally, um, the way these work is that the goal is that, uh, even if two things are similar, it will have like very different hashes usually. And so this is like a standard data structure or a standard tool for building data structures. And so um, they usually have like some awkward mathematical form. So it probably does, does something with the uh, ASCII codes of these and then raises them to some power and uh, does mod something like some cryptographic uh, computation. So it doesn't really matter how you, uh, get from the string to the number. It's just, there's a fixed function to do this. This function is uh, in secular and Samomer hash function, and you can just always use this function. And you don't need to worry about how you get from um, the from a string to the number. Uh, one property of hash functions, usually by definition, is that it's, it's sort of one way. So um, even the number, it's hard to compute the string. So multiple strings map to, will map to the same number, but it's very hard to numerate all the strings that map to a given number. Um, another question is like, uh, would locally sensitive, lo uh, locally sensitive hashing help so that synonyms are mapped to the same index? 
So in this context, I mean, you could do that, but um, I guess people would rather do the things that we talk about in the next two lectures. Um, so here the point is to be really quick and to adapt to new, um, uh, to new vocabularies. LSH would make it much slower and uh, basically, but might capture more semantics. But if you want to capture semantics, we'll talk about more um, unsupervised techniques for capturing semantics. And um, the other question is, so what does L2 normalization mean um, in this context? So it's what um, the normalizer does um, by default. So it means divide each row by its L2 norm. And so each count vector of counts or is divided by um, the root of the sum of squares of the entries. And so the intuition is that you normalize away the length of the document. So if you take a, a document and you append it to itself, let's, let's say you take like, I don't know, Ro Romeo and Juliet, and then you take Romeo and Juliet and you concatenate it with Romeo and Juliet. The, the representation of these should probably be pretty similar. They have pretty much the same content, right? So if you, if you just count each word twice, if you have each word appear twice, that probably should look about the same. And so um, the L2 normalization, the idea is that um, the, the actual counts don't matter. It just ca uh, matters how frequent is one word relative to another word. And so um, actually normalizing away the lengths of the document would be doing L1 distance, uh, sorry, L1 normalization, so dividing by the sum. But people found that L2 normalization works better, in particular because in NLP, people like to use something that's called the um, cosine uh, distance. Cosine distance is basically the inner product between feature vectors, and it makes more sense to look at the inner product of feature vectors if you choose, like in this case, it makes more sense to look at L2 normalization. Because then you talk, you're talk, basically you're talking about angles, and then L2 normalization is sort of the natural thing to do. But the overall idea is normalize away the length of the document. So if you have a longer document that talks about the same things, you probably want it to um, have a very similar representation. All right. So that's that's it for today. Um, any more questions? So. so another question is, um, if you don't use hashing, you would have to rebuild the feature space regularly. Are there uh, other methods to avoid this problem without having to find the entire feature space again? Um, I mean, in practice, it might not be that big a deal to rebuild the vocabulary. Um, so that's sort of the default uh, I would do is just rebuild everything from scratch and sc store all the data if you can. If you can't do this, there's actually a thing called, I think it's called a cuckoo hash, um, which stores hashes in both direct or stores things in both directions. So it allows you to update the vocabulary, but um, it's still as fast. So it keeps the interpreter, sorry, it allows you to, yeah, it allows you to update the vocabulary. You still have the correspondence of the words to the ind index indices, but it's um, um, as fa fast and flexible. I'm not aware of any Python implementation though. So if the question is, is there a way to do this with scikit-learn? Um, the answer is no. Basically, um, yeah. And I, I don't think there is. You could try to do something like partial split. Um, uh, you could try to do partial fit for count vectorizer, but then the, the length of the vector would change as you add more words, and that would be kind of strange. Um, so the question is, um, why does hashing work for streaming data? So it works better for streaming data if you also update the learner because you can Basically, it allows you to add new words to the vocabulary. Because um, as I said, like 
if you look at the news, uh, a new topic might come up. Um, and um, so if you build your model, or if you build your vectorizer, when the word was not in the news, then this word will not be in your vocabulary and you will not be able to learn anything about it, right? Whereas if you use hashing, then um, the word will be mapped to some feature. Maybe that feature was used before, maybe it wasn't used before, but without doing anything on featureization, if you have a model that updates itself, then the model can learn about um, can learn about this new concept. You still obviously would need to rebuild, uh, need to update the model. But basically, with the back of work model, anything that's not in the um, in the vocabulary doesn't exist. You could, of course, also do like a custom model where you say, well, I take my old coefficient vector and I add a zero to my coefficient vector for the new feature that I added now, but um, sort of you need to, would need to invest a lot of manual work to do that. Or you would need to build everything from scratch. All right. Any more questions? Uh, Bernardo, I hope I hope I answered your question. Cool. All right, then um, I'll see you Monday. And as I said, on Wednesday, I will just upload the lecture because um, I can't do a live lecture that day. All right, take care, everybody.